Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is on the Book of the Beginning. And you might guess that, that would be Genesis. This particular lesson number three in that series for April 16 of 2022 is entitled Cain and His Legacy. Hmm, what would his legacy be? We'd like to begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, you went through all of this human history with us step by step, even the history before we came to this earth in heaven with the rebellion of Lucifer and becoming Satan and so forth. You certainly must be tired of all this sin stuff by now. And uh, today we're gonna study a lot about the sin and its consequences Help us to understand it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis 3 and 4 contain many common themes and words. Now you remember that Genesis 3 is a story about the fall when Adam and Eve, Eve was, con was, was deceived by the serpent and then she ate the fruit and she gave it to Adam and then we, we see the temptation, we see the sin, we see the explosion from the garden. There's some very interesting parallels in Hebrews 4. Let's look at those. First, sin is described in Genesis 3, 6 to 8. This, that's the story of Eve there. And two, a description of Cain killing Abel in Genesis 4 to 8. That certainly would qualify as, as sin. Three, curses on the ground, Genesis 3, 17. When they were cast out of the, of the garden, there was, the ground was cursed. And then Genesis 4, 11, it was cursed because of Abel, Abel's blood which was on the ground. And four expulsions are, be, are being driven out. Remember, of course, Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden. <clears throat> and then Cain was a driven, driven away from the presence of God, as described in Genesis 4, 12, and 16. Some interesting parallels in those two situations. There's even a chiastic pattern in this chapter. You want to talk about that, Jim? The events give an idea of what human life will be like after the fall, namely, a mingling of life and death. Birth and crime are intertwined. The structure of chapter four renders this tension through the form of its chiastic structure, alternating between birth and crime. Okay, now you remember these chiastic things, there's many of them in the Bible. We're not so familiar with them in English, people who, don't, who aren't familiar with the, the Hebrew particularly. The pattern there is you, you go step by step down until you hit a central point, and that's the most important point, and then you go backwards out to where you started from. So we see the birth of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Then there's a crime, of course, Cain kills Abel. And then C, the, the most important point is this legacy of Cain and Lamech, which we'll get into in a lot more detail. And then crime was committed by, uh, of course, the first crime was committed by Cain. Now we're talking about the crime that was committed by Lamech. And then finally birth, Adam and Eve give birth to our, their third son that we know about, Seth. And so you can see that the main emphasis in, in our discussion today is going to be the uh, legacy of Cain and Lamech. So what we are seeing in these verses is that almost immediately there's a fulfillment of the curses that resulted from Adam and Eve's sin, but also the promise of a Messiah. Kerry, can you tell us about that? I'm reading from Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Then Adam had intercourse with his wife, and she became pregnant. She bore a son and said, By the Lord's help, I have acquired a son. So she named him Cain. Later she gave birth to another son, Abel. Abel became a shepherd, but Cain was the farmer. I'm sorry. Go ahead. i got to see where... <laughs> That was, that was the end. That's the Good News Bible, okay. I just squeaked it in, yeah. Notice that the first event recorded after talking about Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden is a birth. 
It's not obvious in English, but Adam and Eve believed that this son might be the promised Messiah. From Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 31, the Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. Try to imagine how Adam and Eve felt at the time of the birth of Cain. They had never seen a birth before, and they may have wondered what was happening. Had they witnessed any animal birthings? We don't know, quite possibly. We do not know if God or some angel was sent to them to explain what was happening as Eve's stomach began to swell, and then as she noted the kicking. Did Adam deliver the baby? Was he the first midwife? Have you ever heard of Adam described as a midwife? Or yeah. mid-husband. Or mid-husband, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, we just don't know about those details. A literal translation of Genesis 4, colon, uh, 1 states, I have, and here's a very literal, bringing as much of the Hebrew meaning and implications as possible into English, I have acquired a man, indeed, the Lord himself. It is rendered by the International Standard Version as, I have given birth to a male child, the Lord. And you notice Lord, those two renderings of Lord there, are in small caps. And what does that mean? Yahweh. Yahweh, the name of Yahweh, the personal name of God. The story of Cain occupies most of the chapter. He is the only brother who speaks. At first he was almost worshipped by his parents. I mean, they thought, maybe the Messiah is here. It is interesting to notice the difference in names. Now we recognize that the records we have are here are written in Hebrew by Moses, and we have no idea what language Adam and Eve were speaking. We have no clue. There was one time a terrible experiment that was happened in a country where there were a lot of orphans, and there were big orphanages here and there, and somebody got the brainy idea that let's not speak any language to these children. We'll take care of them, we'll, we won't speak to them at all, and see if natively they will speak Hebrew. Can you imagine anybody doing so anything? And of course, most of those kids died because they weren't getting, they weren't getting love. Yeah. They didn't perceive it so much. Anyway, nevertheless, the name Cain comes from Kana, which, refer, which means to acquire. And so you remember the verse said, we have acquired a son suggesting that Adam and Eve had acquired something powerful and precious. By contrast, the name Abel or Hebel in Hebrew means vapor or breath. Uh, compare Psalm 62, 9 and Psalm 144, 4. This name means elusiveness, emptiness, lack of substance, and in Ecclesiastes it is used to mean vanity. You remember in Ecclesiastes everything is vanity. It seems that Adam and Eve, their hope was rested in their firstborn son, Cain, and not in Abel, his younger brother. Cain was a farmer, a tiller of the ground, it says, Genesis 4, 2. That work involved a lot of physical labor, because remember, God specifically told them, you're going to have to work hard to produce anything from this ground, right? On the other hand, by profession, Abel was a keeper of sheep implying that not that he had worked hard to acquire, as Cain did, but rather that he, he kept the sheep that he had received. And now we have a description of all that, or at least some comments about it, all the way over in the New Testament and even Ellen White. Hebrews 11, 4, it was faith that made Abel offer to God a better sacrifice than Cain's. Through his faith, he won God's approval as a righteous man because God himself approved of his gifts. By means of his faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. And of course, remember God said, Abel's blood is crying to me from the ground. So, Ellen White comments, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. And then they, Cain and Abel, were to show their faith in the blood of Christ as a promised atonement by offering the firstlings of the flock and sacrifice. Besides this, the first fruits of earth were to be presented before the Lord as a thank offering. Now, we know that Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel were partaking what kind of a diet? Fruits, grains, and nuts. Fruits, grains, all vegetable as opposed to animal. A vegetarian diet, weren't they? And so we just said here, Ellen White demonstrates that her, she understands 
the original Hebrew, even though she never had studied anything like that, they all presented the first fruits. So that means Abel offered the first fruits, but he also offered a lamb. Okay? We do not know if God had given Adam, Eve, and their children specific instructions about offering the first fruits of their land. If they were given such instructions, Abel no doubt complied with them. The Hebrew implies that Abel complied with all of God's instructions, offering not only the fruit of the land, which was what he ate each day, but also the animal sacrifice. Cain refused or neglected to do so. So what is our relationship to God as we worship Him? Do we feel that we are somehow earning our salvation? Is there anything that we could give God that could pay for our salvation? Sure, a lot of people think that that's what God wants is stuff. Yeah, right. Okay. I'm not sure how we would give Him stuff. You throw it up in the air and hope He catches it? Well, that's what offerings are, are yeah. and sacrifices, as if yeah. God is in need of any of that You're going to appease Him somehow. Yeah. Okay, you want to? Micah 6, verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep and endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn child to pay for my sins? Isaiah 1, verse 11. He, that is the Lord, says, Do you think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering me? I have had more than enough of sheep you burn as sacrifices and of the fat of your fine animals. I am tired of the blood of, of bulls and sheep and goats. You suppose, let me interrupt there for a second. Do you suppose that the Pharisees and the Sadducees who had this wonderful market going on, selling all these animals and sacrificing them, etc., did they ever preach about this, I am tired of the blood of bulls and sheep and goats? I think we can be pretty sure that that wasn't the case. There's a book called... Uh, Jerusalem in the time of Jesus by the fellow by the name of Joachim Jeremias. And he explains how the bl blood just flowed down yeah. out, out of it like a stream down into the Kidron Valley. Yeah. And they, they, they bring the, uh, the sheep or whatever the offering was, and they, they'd have an inspector and, oh, that isn't good enough, and you've got to take this. And so then they sell them another one. They'd run the other one around the back and, uh, and recycle it, and, and yeah. the next people came. I mean, it was just a corrupt s s system you can get. Uh, Genesis. We don't do anything like that today. Oh, I think we got our uh, analog ways of doing it. <laughs> analog, it's going to be Genesis 4, 3 to 8. After some time, Cain brought some of the harvest and gave it to as an offering to the Lord. Then Abel brought the first lamb to be born, excuse me, first lamb born to one of his sheep, killed it and gave them the best parts of it as an offering. The Lord was pleased with Abel and his offering, and he rejected Cain and his offering. Cain became furious and he scowled in anger. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why that you scowl, on, why that scowl on your face? If you had done the right thing, you would be smiling. But because you have done evil, sin is crouching at your door and it wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the fields. When they were out in the fields, Cain turned on his brother and killed him. Now, um, we assume that Moses got this information perhaps by inspiration. Um, what do you think Cain said to his parents when he came back home? Haven't seen Abel. Have you? <laughs> wow. I mean, he must have told them. I mean, where did this information come that he said to his brother, let's go out in the fields? Yeah. I mean, the Probably only one. eventually confessed. Okay. First John 3, verse 12. We must not be like Cain. He belonged to the evil one and murdered his own brother, Abel. Why did Cain murder him? Because the things he himself did were wrong, but the things his bro Oop. brother... <laughs> I'm sorry. This thing is so touchy. But the things his brother did were right. Mm-hmm. That is from the Good News Bible. We, of course, do not know all that was behind Cain's, Cain's anger, 
against Abel. Certainly there was more involved in the fact that one sacrifice was not accepted. Was this perhaps a repeat, repeated offense? We, we don't know. Cain responded in two ways. He was, one, he was angry, and two, his countenance fell, according to Genesis 4, 5. He was angry be against God because he felt he was being treated unfairly, and he was jealous of his brother Abel, whose sacrifice had been accepted. Why do you think Cain killed his brother? Whatever we suggest would probably only be hypothetical. But here is one comment from a Bible scholar, Eli Weissel. Carrie? Okay. Why did he do it? Perhaps he wanted to remain alone, an only child, and after his parents' death, the only man, like God, and perhaps alone in the place of God. Cain killed to become God. Any man who takes himself for God ends up assassinating men. Yeah. Messages of God, biblical portraits and legends. Quoted an adult Sabbath school Bible study guide for Friday, April 15. Okay, there's a there's an interesting possibility. Look at Cain's discussion with God. God did not directly accuse Cain initially, but raised a question, giving Cain an opportunity to admit his guilt and to repent. What do you think God would have done if he said, I'm sorry? And he truly meant it. How would, that, how would that be different from any other human that's lived before or yeah. after? Except that he would be repentant. Yeah. God urged Cain to do what was right. But reconciliation with God must be done on God's terms, not on our terms. Cain's second response implied that Cain was more in line with his sin than being in line with God. God's plan for each of us is not just to be forgiven, Remember, we believe that God is forgiveness personified, so it's no problem for God to forgive us, but also to attain victory over sin. Pardon? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people, but God keeps his promise and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. Good News Bible. So, I mean, we, we recognize that God could have forced Cain to do what he ought to have done. However, God does not use force. And, and now just, just to confirm that, here's something from Ellen White. She's speaking specifically about events just before the coming of Christ, so it's a long, 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 much later in the history of our world, but the earth was dark through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love. And love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. No angels would suffice. Nobody else could do the job. Only Jesus. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings, quote, quoting Malachi 4.2, and that's from Desire of Ages, page 22 of the first paragraph. Putting that alongside Genesis 4, 9 to 16, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? He answered, I don't know. Am I supposed to take care of my brother? I mean, I wonder, I, I just, you know, how did, how did God talk to Cain? Did he, did he show up as a person and pr just pretend like he was ignorant and asking questions? Or did he, did he thunder out of the sky with a voice? Or anybody have any insights into that? <laughs> well, certainly many times since then, God has appeared as a human. Yeah. Kind of on, on the person's equal, such as with Abraham. Yeah. And uh, a few times he's also- to Emmaus and yeah. so on. A few times he's also thundered from the sky 
and, and more. Yes. Going on here, then the Lord said, Yahweh himself said, why have you done this terrible thing? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground like a voice calling for revenge. I mean, what do you think? If you killed your brother and God starts talking about revenge, that might be kind of serious, right? You're, you are placed under a curse and can no longer farm the soil. Whoa. It has soaked up your brother's blood as if it had opened its mouth to receive it when you killed him. If you try to grow crops, the soil will not produce anything. You will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. So uh, could he literally not farm anything or was it reduced output? Kind of like we have, or do he, we know? Was it, was it necessary for him to either purchase or, or beg from somebody else who produced it? Or harvest it. Yeah. I was uh, stuff that was growing. This is the first time I'd ever carefully considered the implications of, of those verses. And Cain said to the Lord, this punishment is too hard for me to bear. You are driving me off the land and away from your presence. Now, Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden. Now Cain is driven away from God's presence. Let's think about that for a moment. I will be a homeless wanderer on the earth and anyone who finds me will kill me. But the Lord answered, No, if anyone kills you, seven lives will be taken in revenge. So the Lord put a mark on Cain, and we wonder what that mark was like, to warn anyone who met him not to kill him. He did a big sign on his forehead that said, Don't kill. <laughs> it's interesting. And Cain went away from the Lord's presence and lived in a land called Wandering, which is east of Eden, from our Good News Bible. So I ask this question again. How was God speaking to Cain? Did he appear in human form or did Cain just hear a voice? Had God ever spoken to Cain before? Before that? Or had Cain ever heard God speaking to Adam and Eve? If not, how did Cain identify who was talking? Was Cain able to farm again or not? Now, there's a possibility of something that, this is again hypothetical, but we know that Adam and Eve and presumably his, the children came to the gate of the garden to offer their sacrifices. And who was at the gate of the garden? Angels. Angels. So maybe they spoke to Cain. God's question to Cain is similar to his earlier question to Adam and Eve. Where are you? Adam and Eve recognized their guilt. Cain refused to do so. Then God proceeded to make it very clear to Cain that he knew exactly what Cain had done, killing his brother. So God, step by step, you know, where's your brother? I know what you did. Your brother's blood is crying to me. And what is the result of sin? Adam and Eve's sin resulted in? Genesis 3.19 you will have to work hard and sweat to make the soil produce anything until you go back to the soil from which you were formed. You were made from soil and you will become soil again. <laughs> and we just read that for Cain, apparently, he was a great farmer, apparently, and now God says the soil is not going to produce. Maybe it's just reduced, as Gordon suggested. We don't know exactly what that's implying. If he, if he couldn't get anything in any way, obviously he would die quickly. I have to believe that before the flood, the earth produced much, much better than it does now or any time since the flood. And You would certainly you know, think so. I just suspect that the sweat to produce was just more sweat than they were before, but what do I know? Well, Genesis 4.14 says, what is the significance of Cain's words? I shall be hidden from your face. Gary? Oh, sorry. Uh, one thing that one, uh, makes me wonder is if you've ever dealt with sheep, they get fly blown now. Didn't they have problems like that back then? And it riddles the sheep, it can kill them. Yeah. Well, it yeah. certainly wasn't the disease back then that there is now, so. No. Yeah. yeah. Prob probably not. Anyway, Genesis 4. 14 to 16, you, God, are driving me off the land and away from your presence. I will be a homeless wanderer on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. 
and Cain went away from the Lord's presence, from the Good News Bible. Okay, now I have a big question. What does it mean to go away from, the God, from your God's presence? Or he went away from the Lord's presence Genesis, in those verses you just read? If God is omnipresent, what does that mean? Everywhere. He's present everywhere. Is it even possible to go away from God's presence? That would only be possible if one chooses to shut himself away from God. Ellen White wrote of a threefold curse. The first curse on, on the ground came because of Adam and Eve's sin and their expulsion from the garden. The second curse came because of Abel's blood shed on the ground. The third curse came because of the rejection of God by the antediluvians, which resulted in a flood. And so we have these words. Gordon. When the faithful dead shall be resurrected and the king of glory shall open before them the gates of the city of God and the nations who have kept the truth enter in, what beauty and glory will meet the astonishing, astonished sight of those who have seen no greater beauties in the earth than that which they beheld in decaying nature after the threefold curse was upon the earth. That's from Ellen White, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 88. So how did Cain and his family survive and multiply after God's curse which drove them away from the soil? Well, let's look at the rest of the story, we're, since we're focusing on that. What was the result of Cain's sin? Genesis 4, 17 to 24, and I will read. Cain and his wife, oh boy, where did she come from? They had a be son. A sister. Must be a sister. Cain and his wife had a son and named him Enoch. Then Cain built a city and named it after his son. And, I mean, he built a city, who's going to live there? Are these people just multiplying like something and there's already people trying to live there? This is a different son, than, a different Enoch than the This Enoch is not the Enoch we, one that we, we that yeah. shortly before the flood, no. Yeah. Enoch had a son named Ired, who was the father of Mahujael. And Mahujael was a, had a son named Methusael, who was the father of Lamech. Lamech had two wives, Ada and Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal who was the ancestor of those who raise livestock and live in tents. Now, I thought that's what Cain was doing. His brother was Jubal, the ancestor of all musicians who play the harp and the flute. Zillah gave birth to Tubal Cain who made all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. That's very interesting. One of the few women who is mentioned that we know nothing at all about her except that she was a sister to Tubal Cain. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. I have killed a young man because he struck me. If seven lives are taken to pay for killing Cain, 77 will be taken if anyone kills me. So what's he saying? I'm bigger than Cain. Yeah, I'm more important. So we've asked the question, where did Cain's wife come from? We're gonna, we've got several questions to look at here. She had to be a daughter of Adam, Adam and Eve. Did she, did she rebel against God as well? Or did she marry Cain just because he was the eldest son and considered to be the most important? Where did Enoch's wives, Ada and Zillah, come from? Were they all descendants of Cain? It is important to notice that Cain did not try to comment about his sin, despite the fact that God had pointed out very specifically. Lamech, Cain's great, great, great grandson, did what? Jim? Refer, uh, refers to Cain's crime in the context of his own. While Cain keeps silent about his only recorded crime, Lamech seems to be boasting about his, expressing it in song. Genesis 4, 23 and 24. While Cain asks for God's mercy, Lamech is not recorded as asking for it. While Cain is avenged seven times by God, Lamech believes that he will be avenged 77 times. See Genesis chapter 4, verse 24. A hint that he is very much aware of his guilt. From the Bible Study Guide for April 14. He's aware of his guilt and he's boasting about it. Yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> Writers wrote a song about it. 
Cain, as far as we know, only married one wife, Genesis 4:17. Lamech <coughs> multiplied his evils by marrying at least two wives, verse 19. Thus, in a brief history, there was the beginning of the multiplication of evil. Cain's great sin led finally to one, the antediluvians being eliminated in the flood, and two, Noah and his family being preserved in the ark. But that's not the end, that is not the end of the story. Adam knew his wife again, and she gave birth to a son called Seth, whose name means another seed in the place of Abel. Gary? I'm speaking from Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. Adam and his wife had another son. She said, God has given me a son to replace Abel, whom Cain killed. So she named him Seth. And there's a footnote, Seth, this name sounds like the Hebrew for has given. Seth had a son whom he named Enosh. It was then that people began using the words holy name in worship. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, it's interesting to notice that the name Seth is derived from the Hebrew word hashit, I will put, which introduced, to the, messianic pro which introduced the messianic promise in Genesis 3.15. So, what does that verse say? I will put enmity, okay, between thee and the serpent, between, right? And so the, that's, that's the word from which we get the name Seth. As we now know, the messianic seed would be passed through Seth to his descendants, and of course, there's Genesis 5, 21 talks about that, and then the full list, or at least a fairly comprehensive list, is in Matthew 1, 1 to 17, and Luke 3, 23 30 through 38, which is even more comprehensive. Why don't we have records of any of the other children of Adam and Eve? Why are no daughters mentioned? Did they all follow the downward course of Satan? Now we have a question that's been asked by so many people, and we need to try to straighten this one out. Who were the sons of God and who were the daughters of men? Genesis 6, 2. Genesis 6, 2 in the King James. Then the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, does, does, go ahead. I was just going to read it from the King James, from the Good News. Oh, go ahead. From the Good News, some of the heavenly beings, that is, sons of God, saw that these young women, that is, daughters of men, were beautiful, so they took the ones they liked. Okay, so now we have a conundrum, a serious problem. There were no heavenly beings who came down to this earth and cohabited with human women. Now, if you know about Greek and Latin or Roman um, mythology, what, what, what goes on there? That's what, that's what most of the uh, gods and sub-gods are, is cohabitation of, of... Yeah, exactly. So this is a very common idea from way back there. Anyway, the, my, my evidence for that is, first of all, humans were a new and distinct order of beings able to reproduce after their own kind. This tells us that angels and the beings inhabiting other worlds do not have that ability. So th even if there were gods who wanted to come down here and take wives, there's no way they could produce. And we'll, I'll give you my uh, more reasons for that in just a moment. Here's Ellen White's statement. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. What does new and distinct mean? No one else is just like that, right? They were made in the image of God and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. So He made us with the ability to procreate, we call it. We come together and we have children in our image. They were to live in close communion with heaven, receiving His power from the source of all power. Upheld by God, they were to live sinless lives. That's the Review and Herald, February 11, 1902. It's also in the STA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1081, paragraph 3. Now here's my compelling argument, at least in my mind. If Satan, as a fallen angel, had the ability to reproduce, he would have filled this world full of little Satans. You, I can guarantee it. <laughs> so, where do we get then the idea that who the sons of God were? Luke 3, 38. 
In describing the ancestry of Jesus, Luke concluded with these significant words. The son of Enosh, we've already heard about him. The son of Seth, we've heard about him. The son of Adam, we know about him. The son of God, from my Good News Bible. So what does that imply? We human beings, at least initially, were supposed to be considered to be sons of God, right? Children of God. The implication of these words is that those who followed God's will for their lives would always be considered to be sons of God. Jim? The descendants of Seth were called the sons of God, the descendants of Cain, the sons of men. Can I interrupt for a second? Who says they were called? Does that mean that the sons of men called the sons of God? They called them the sons of God? Did they, or were, did, or were they, I mean, you, you know, considering the way people behave in our day. Well, Jesus was the son of God, but he became son of man. Yeah, he, he was both. Yeah. Anyway. As the sons of God mingled with sons of men, they became corrupt and by intermarriage with them, lost through the influence of the sons of Cain. Oh, of their wives, influence of their wives. Influence of their wives, their peculiar holy character and united with the sons of Cain in their idolatry. Many cast aside the fear of God and trampled upon his commandments. But there were a few that did righteousness, who feared and honored their creator. Noah and his family were among the righteous few. Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 66. So what about the giants mentioned in Genesis 6? Carrie? Uh, speaking from Genesis 6, verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. That's from the King James Version. Okay, go those, ahead. Those who honored and feared to offend God at first felt the curse but lightly, while those who turned from God and trampled upon his authority felt the effects of the curse more heavily, especially in stature and nobleness of form. It's from Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, Page 66, paragraph 1. Okay. <coughs> Could we take from that that the giants, the quote giants, were God's faithful? So because they hadn't deteriorated in stature and nobleness as much as the, the follower, I mean the descendants of Cain. That's what it looks the like. The giants were the descendants of Seth. Yeah, at least some of them. Yeah. yeah. Thus we can see that the giants that were in the land were descendants of Seth rather than descendants of Cain. This very likely resulted from their following from their following God's diet and lifestyle. That would be the descendants of, of Seth. Following down the line of Seth, we come to Noah. Reading from Genesis 6, verses 1 through 8. When the human race had spread all over the world and daughters were being born, seven, some of the heavenly beings, and we've read this before, sons of God, saw that these young women, daughters of men, were beautiful, so they took the ones they liked. Then the Lord said, I will not allow people to live forever. They are mortal. From now on, they will live no longer than 120 years. In those days, and even later, there were giants on the earth, and this we just read, who were descendants of human women and the heavenly beings. They were the great heroes and famous men of long ago. So we're suggesting that these so-called heavenly beings are really the sons of God in the line of Seth. Go ahead. When the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time, he was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. He was so filled with regret that he said, I will wipe out these people I have created and also the animals and the birds because I am sorry that I made any of them but the Lord was pleased with Noah. So there was at least one exception, right? So how are we gonna explain, I'm sorry I did this, did God make a mistake? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna explore that. 
here in a moment. No, he didn't make a mistake. He knew what he was doing and uh, it was all for to work things out the best that could happen after after Lucifer sinned and separated from God. Well, just before the do days of Noah, we have the story of Enoch. This is the Enoch that most of us know about. Enoch became a preacher of righteousness, making known to the people what God had revealed to him. Those who feared the Lord sought out this holy man to share his instruction and his prayers. Now, where did he get his information? Was it directly communicated with God, from God? Presumably. He labored... Probably, he probably, didn't he overlap with Adam? Probably. We suspect, so he probably got a lot of wisdom from Adam and Eve and Certainly Seth. from, yeah, yeah. He labored publicly also, bearing God's message to all who would hear the words of warning. His labors were not restricted to the Sethites. In the land where Cain had, sought, Cain had sought to flee from the divine presence, that's that land he called wandering, the prophet of God made known, known the wonderful scenes that had passed before his visions. So that suggests that God made these things apparent to him in visions, right? Yeah. Behold, he declared, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. And where do we read that? In the book of Genesis? No, no, that's in the book of Jude, the next to the last book of the New Testament, verses 14 and 15. That's from quoted in Patriarchs and Prophets 86, paragraph 1. So coming back to our story now, let's follow down through as we wrap this up. Genesis 5, verses 22 to 24 says, After that, Enoch lived in fellowship with God for 300 years and had other children. He lived to be 365 years old. He spent his life in fellowship with God, and then he disappeared because God took him away. And the King James Version puts it this way, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. So what happened to the rest of those sons and daughters? And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years, and Enoch walked with, I'm sorry, um, yeah, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And you all, I'm sure, must have heard the story about the young guy who said that he understood this young kid, this, he understood this story, he said one day they were walking together and God says, we're closer to my house than we are to your house, let's just go home to my house. Well, so Enoch was such a great guy, he had, he had these children, what happened to those children? That's my question. We, we just don't know anything about them. Well, Enoch almost lived to the flood, we think. Yeah. His well, children... Well, no, there was a pretty good gap there because his son was Methuselah, who lived 969 years. Well, that would be 600 years beyond Enoch's life. Died in the year of the flood. Okay. Before, and Methuselah died the year of the flood. So there's a 600 year gap in there. Well, at least we don't have any record they got on the boat. No. Yeah. So why did all these good parents not teach their children well? Yeah. Or did the children not learn well? Yeah. Well, we're gonna Do we have a parallel anywhere? We're gonna, yeah, wow. He, Enoch, now we're, again, looking at Ellen White's words, was a fearless reprover of sin while he preached the love of God in Christ to the people of his time and pleaded with them to forsake their evil ways, he rebuked the prevailing iniquity and warned the men of his generation that judgment would surely be visited upon the transgressor. Well, I mean, you know, the devil and his company must have been working really hard on these few faithful people. It was the spirit of Christ that spoke through Enoch that spirit is manifested not alone in utterances of love, compassion, and entreaty. It is not smooth things only that are spoken by holy men. God puts into the heart and lips of his messengers truths to utter that are keen and cutting as a two-edged sword. Patriarchs and Prophets 86, paragraph 2. So, why do you suppose the lifespans of those who lived before the flood, the antediluvians, decreased in length so dramatically? There are a lot of questions about those early numbers. Um, Jim? Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 to 32. This is a list of the... All right. 
This is the list of the descendants of Adam. When God created human beings, he made them like himself. He created them male and female, blessed them and named them hu humanity. When, uh, it's interesting that, to understand, explain that, the name Adam actually means mankind or humanity. Go ahead. When Adam was 130 years old, he had a son who was just like him and he named him Seth. After that, Adam lived another 800 years. He had other children and died at the age of 930. More when, children, we don't know what happened to them. When Seth was 105, he had a son Enosh and then uh, lived another 807 years and he had other children and died at the age of 912. When Enish was 90, he had a son, Kenan, and then lived another 815 years, and he had other children and died at the age of 905. When Kenan was 70, he had a son of Math Malahel, Mahalalel. Mahalalel, and then lived another 840 years, and he had other children and died at the age of 910. When Mahalahel was 65, he had a son, Jared, and then lived an, another 830 years, and he had other children and died at the age of 895. When Jared was 162, he had a son, Enoch, and then lived 800, another 800 years, and he had other children and died at the age of 962. When Enoch was 65, he had a son, Methuselah. After that, it, Enoch lived in fellowship with God for 300 years and had other children. He lived to be 365 years old and spent his life in fellowship with God and then he disappeared because God took him away. When Methuselah was 187, he had a son Lamech and then uh, lived another 782 years and came, then he came other children and died at the age of 969. When Lamech was 182, he had a son and said, from the very ground who, on which the Lord put a curse, this child will bring us relief from all our hard work. So he named him Noah. Lamech lived another 900, excuse me, 595 years, and he had other children that died at the age of 777. So oh, things are getting a little shorter slowly, but now it's starting to taper off pretty fast. After Noah was 500 years old, he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, from the Good News Bible. So you probably, you may be aware that the, these numbers are accurate according to years as do, I'm asking you the question, are these years accurate according to the, the years as we understand them? You may be aware that there are two ancient translations of the books of Moses, which give quite different numbers for these ages. Why might that be? Is it possible that we do not even understand the numbering system, the system that they used? That's possible. Or even the numbering system that Moses used? That's possible. Who gave Moses this information? Was this passed down from father to child, to father to son, to so forth? Or uh, was it given to him by God? Or were these numbers passed down from parent to child all the way until the days of Moses? As we have seen, Genesis 4 is filled with the crimes of Cain and of Lamech. But it begins with the birth of Cain, whom Adam and Eve thought would be the Messiah. It ends with the birth of Seth, who ended up being the father of the line of the faithful. So, now we're going to talk about another... Go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Uh, the sacrifice of Cain, we're talking from Genesis 4... Verses 3 and 4. While Cain chose to take his offering only from, quote, the fruit of the ground, Genesis 4, 3, Abel also brought his offering. Genesis 4, 4, New King Okay, now Cain. that's, let's, let's think about it for a moment. We read, it, if you read between the lines, apparently they were all offering fruits and vegetables. But Cain also brought uh, a lamb. So, go ahead. Okay. Thus, in contrast to uh, Cain's offering, Abel, 
Abel's offering included a sacrificial animal as God commanded. Yet, while Abel complied with the divine instructions, Cain chose to ignore them. Also, a comparison of the two acts of offering reveals a slight nuance between them. While Cain offers to God and Abel just offers, the mention to God is absent from the description of Abel's sacrifice. <clears throat> this little difference is of profound significance as it reflects two fundamentally different views of worship. While Cain thinks of his offering as his gift to God, Abel understands his sacrifice as a reminder of God's gift to him. So this is an important difference. You see, Cain says, I'm doing something for you, God, hoping to make you happy kind of thing. And Abel says, here's a gift that you gave me, which I'm giving back and sacrifice to you. Okay? While Cain views his religion as an upward movement to God, Abel experiences it as a downward movement from God. This contrasting mentality also may explain another difference regarding how the offerings have been chosen. Abel's offering was not, per se, a better offering than Cain's. In fact, Cain's fruit may even have been, uh, have been a better product than the sheep provided by Abel. The difference, however, was that Abel chose from the Becherah, the first fruits, the most precious product of the season, something that would be justified later by the Mosaic legislation. Okay, let's stop and try to explain this. It's getting kind of deep here a little bit. Yes. So, apparently Abel bought his, brought his first fruits. Cain bought the first fruits, but Cain, Abel also brought the lamb that was suggested by God. Um, there probably was nothing, we don't have any reason to suspect there was anything wrong with Cain's offering. It was probably perfectly good fruits and vegetables, whatever they were, probably perfectly good. But he wasn't following God's directions. Well, if you read, uh, I think it was verse, uh, is it verse 6? And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your sad? So forth. If you do well, will you not have honor? Now, I mean, this is the base Bible in basic English. My, my understanding it has to, to do with Cain's attitude. Yeah. Uh, it, it, God didn't want the sacrifice uh, or, or an offering or anything. He just. Uh, if, if you don't need to make a distinction between the fruits and vegetables or, and uh, animals. If the, it was. Cain's attitude was, yeah. was a serious problem. Okay, Carrie. All right. Uh, Even though I think in Hebrews it says something, it, it, it talks about the uh, sac the, the yeah. offering. It, it's, uh, Hebrews 11. Yeah. Against the background of the preceding chapters, each of the two offerings evokes something different. The fruit offering from the ground, and in brackets it's got the word Adama, points to Genesis 3.19 which is associated with human effort and the perspective of death. The animal offering, on the other hand, points to Genesis 3.21 and gives the promise of the divine protection and the perspective of life. Cain's offering was the expression of human work to reach God. Abel's offering was the expression of humanity's need for God's salvation. Furthermore, Abel's offering was related to the promise of the Messianic Lamb of Genesis 3.15, who would be sacrificed to save the world, whereas Cain's offering was an empty ritual. Note the same contrast between the human clothing. And it mentions Genesis 3.7. That was the fig leaves that they sewed together. Go ahead. Which uses the vegetal fig leaf and the divine clothing which uses animal skin and implies a sacrifice of blood. It's from Genesis 3.21, Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide 40-41. through 41. What can we learn from a careful look at the Hebrew regarding the crime of Cain? And here's some more complicated stuff. Gordon? I hesitate to even try. The use of the phrase, Weyumer Kwayan, Quote, and Cain said, echoing the phrase 
something else that means the Lord said to Cain from Genesis 4, 6, indicates that Cain was supposed to respond to God. Yet instead of responding to God by faith, Cain turns to his brother and kills him. Genesis 4, 8. It is significant that Cain's crime immediately follows this shift in dialogue from the failed vertical to the horizontal. The mechanism of the first religious crime is thus suggested. The crimes of the zealous ones are not committed because they feel they are right. The crimes of fanaticism and religious intolerance derive, on the contrary, from the failure to respond to God's word. Okay. There were some serious problems going with Cain. This yeah. is, this is yeah. too sketchy to give you a, a, a decent flavor of what was going on. This, this yeah. guy was a, was a bad dude. Yeah, we don't have very much information, but it's a bad situation. All this from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Do you want yeah. to terminate? 1 John 3, verse 12. Go ahead. We must not be like Cain. He belonged to the evil one and murdered his own brother Abel. Why did Cain murder him? Because the things he himself did were wrong, but the things his brother did are right. There is also a contrast between uh, the crime of Cain and the crime of Lamech. Unlike Cain, Lamech took murder one step further. We've already talked about he, his boasting about his sin. Lamech ignores God and instead subjects his wives to a litany of his prowess and his homicidal feat as a feat worthy of approbation or praise. I mean, he's singing about it. So what lessons from, should we learn from this study? What is the relationship between human anger and murder? What lessons of self-control do we need to learn? Well, Matthew 5, if you remember, says, if you're angry with your brother, it's just almost as if you were going to kill him. So, and why is that? Because in God's vision, the, the, it's the thought that counts. It, you may not be able to do something, but the thought. Sin starts right here. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think the behavior of Cain was so different from the behavior of Abel or Seth? We do not know how long a period of time there was between the birth of Cain and the birth of Seth. Obviously, God knew in advance what was going to happen with each of those brothers. Why do you think Seth was so different from his older brother Cain? And of course, from there on, we have these two, these, these two legacies, as we call them. The Cain's legacy and Seth's legacy, and what a contrast. I hope you found this lesson challenging as we have. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's sad to read about the beginning of sin and all the troubles in the early days. We don't know about, we know very little about Cain and about Lamech, but we know enough to know that they, they took a wrong path. We also know very little about Abel and about Seth but at least they were doing their best to follow you. Help us to follow their example and not the example of Cain and Lamech is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.